Professor Nikrasevich. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you see me well? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. It's great. So, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be back in Kiev. And I guess that's my per first in person talk since 2020. Since the, yeah, since March 2020. It was really exciting. Uh, it is, uh, my talk is in some way a continuation of the talk of uh, on groups defined by uh, orbit by triographs. So I will uh, shortly recall uh, what uh, he talked about, and uh, then I'll talk about my examples of groups. So let S, oh, it's too, too thick. Let's S be a finite set. And uh, we say that a graph gamma is uh, uh, perfectly labeled, perfectly S labeled, if uh, for every vertex, uh, it, it, it gamma is a directed graph with multiple edges and loops. And if you take any vertex and take all edges that go out, they are labeled uh, bijectively by uh, elements of S. And similarly, so there is exactly one edge labeled by each symbol. And the same is true for incoming edges. So for every letter, there is exactly one edge labeled by that letter. Uh, so if you have a perfectly labeled graph, then for every uh, vertex and every uh, letter S, then as I said, there will be exactly one edge labeled by that letter. And we, we say that there will be exactly one edge out, getting out of the vertex, starting at that vertex, labeled by that letter. So the end of the vertex will be, by definition, the image of that vertex by the action of that symbol. And because also for the incoming vertices, there is a bijection, this will be a permutation. So uh, every letter will define a permutation of the set of vertices. Uh, so we can then generate, if you have such an S labeled, perfectly S labeled graph, uh, then each letter is a permutation of the set of vertices, and we take the group generated by these permutations. Here, the group uh, generated uh, by the, these permutation. Uh, that's the group defined by the graph. So it's defined by the graph. So uh, the graph, this, in other words, the graph describes the action of the generators. Whatever the generator, you just draw the arrow how that generator acts on that surface. Uh, it's sometimes natural to assume that graph gamma is connected, which is equivalent to the condition that the action is transitive. And sometimes I implicitly will uh, assume that. Uh, one important observation that the graph itself is not very important uh, because uh, what is important are finite subgraphs. So if you have a product of generators, and you want to know how that product acts on the vertex, if you're using left action, which may be unnatural, you have to uh, find a path uh, associated with this product, so labeled by this product, and the end of this path will be the image of the vertex. So a group element product is identity if and only if all such paths starting in every vertex are loops. 
So if you want to know if an element is identity or not, you need to know only uh, balls or radius. Well, n is enough, but, but yeah. So if so, it means that in order to know that G is identity, you need to know only what kind of walls or radius are the P in your graph. So, and that's a finite set. So, just you can list all possible walls or radius R which appear in this graph, or radius N which appear in this graph, and you will know if a given product of length N is identity or not. So, in other words, another observation is that if you have two graphs, perfectly labeled graphs, gamma one and gamma two, and uh, balls or radius Rn in both graphs are the same, so if the sets, if the sets of isomorphism classes of balls false or radius are, are, e, are the same the same in both graphs and the same products of length that are are equal to identity in both groups so it means then the, the killing graphs I'm sorry uh, yeah, then the walls are used are in the key graphs of these groups. Or radius are in the key graphs are isomorphic. Sorry, let me let me put it again. So if you have two graphs, gamma one and gamma two, and the sets of Isomorphism classes of walls of radius are so isomorphism classes are the same in both uh, graphs. Then the uh, then the Kelly graphs walls of radius are in the Kelly graphs of these groups are isomorphic. Okay, so that's an uh, easy observation. Uh, and so, in some sense, the yeah, only local structure of the graph is important. And similarly to the talk of uh, I will talk, I will be interested in graphs which are lines. So, our graphs will be the set of vertices will be uh, the set of integers. And uh, edges are either loops or edges connecting uh, neighboring well, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Um, are either loops or edges connecting neighboring. Uh, uh, integers. So graphs of this kind. And they are not oriented, so we assume that each edge represents two directions. So the generators will be evolutions. So our groups will be generated by evolutions. In other, in other words, if we consider permutation, our set of permutations of, uh, uh, of the integers satisfying the condition that image of every natural number is a distance at most one from, from the from the integer. So you can see the such groups. And surprisingly, it's a very rich class of groups with very uh, interesting properties. And as I mentioned before, it's not, it's not important what exactly the graph is. What is important are only finite subgraphs. So it's only important what is the set of finite uh, sub intervals in this graph uh, we get? Remember, these graphs are labels. A, B, e, C, D. E. Uh, so 
so you can describe this graph by a sequence of connections of connectors. Uh, so, for example, one of the ways is to describe for each uh, interval between n and n plus one what are the labels of edges connecting n and n plus one. All the missing labels will be used. So this sequence will be described by a sequence of subsets, a1, a2, a3, a0, a minus one, and so on, where an describe the set, the set of labels of the edges between n to n plus one. Uh, so this graph will be described by such a sequence, and by what I uh, mentioned a minute ago, the sequence is not important. What is important is the set of finite subwords of this sequence. If you have two sequences with the same sets of finite subwords, these two sequences will define the same group. And that's something that uh, is a subject of symbolic dynamics. If you have an infinite sequence, and we consider all finite subsequences which appear there and then consider all infinite sequences with the same uh, finite subsequences you get something called a shift subshift and so the subshift is what is important so the important part is this kind of symbolic dynamics of this shift so the language of this shift so what is important is the language of all the set of all Finite subwords of this sequence. So that's uh, uh, that's what actually also Professor Rivertsov was talking about in his talk. Uh, and classically in symbolic dynamics, the, there are some notions which are important. For example, the notion of repetitivity. Uh, so a sequence. So suppose we have a sequence. Over a finite alphabet. So in our case, this sequence uh, of elements of subsets of S, and we say that it is repetitive, repetitive if for every subword. Word V is a private segment of W that exists R such that let's call V such that V appears in W with gaps of lengths. Less than R. So, what it does, whatever finite subword you take, B, you will see copies of this word everywhere. And moreover, the gaps between these copies are length of these gaps are bounded by R. So, it's like it's a form of periodicity. What's the periodicity? Again, that was mentioned in the YouTube talk. Uh, that appears in quasi crystals and things like that. And this is related to the condition of minimality of the associated subshift. Uh, uh, another important condition is linear repetitivity. Linear repetitivity is when this R is bounded above by a linear function of the length of V. So, the best case scenario. Is that when r is comparable with b? So if r is like r is less than some constant times length of b, then we say that uh, the action that this word is linearly repetitive. Okay, so now I formulate several theorems. Theorem one, which is a corollary of the theorem by Euston, by Kate Euston, and Monon, Nicolas Monon. Says that if that sequence is repetitive, then 
of the group defined by this graph is amenable. In particular, it will not contain any free subgroups. Uh, another theorem, which is a little bit harder to formulate, I am not formulating it in full generality. Maybe I should start at the beginning of the slide. Uh, uh, I will formulate it in a very particular situation. So suppose our set S contains a subset with three symbols B, C, and D. And suppose that W, so that defining the graph is, is linearly repetitive. And uh, there is a word of this form uh, that you have three sequences. Let me draw it this way. You have some infinite word in this direction. Let's call it U minus, then B and C, and then U plus, which is the same word but symmetric with respect to U minus. Then again, the same word CD, and then U plus U minus, and then uh, BD plus, and suppose that these three belong to the subshift generated by W. So suppose that all all finite subwords sub uh, subwords of these. Appear in W. So suppose that the subshift generated by W contains these three such three subwords, so such three, sorry, infinite sequences. Then the group is, uh, the group has intermediate words. Then G has the intermediate words. So it is growth is sub exponential. The word growth is exponential, but faster than any polynomial growth. So the crucial uh, conditions here is linear repetitivity. And it seems to be a very strong condition. So, how can you ensure that uh, the word is linear repetitive? Surprisingly, there is a very easy way to produce a repetitive. Sequence, linearly repetitive sequences, namely using substitutions. If you take, if you uh, construct using that method, uh, the, uh, the group that you get, the graph that you get, the sequence that you get will be linearly repetitive. So let me give you an example, uh, also explain, which will explain you what it means to be uh, linearly, uh, so what, is, what, is, what I mean under substitution. What I mean on a substitution is equivalent to the classical definition, but the definition that I will give will be a little bit uh, different. So, for instance, how can you describe the graph defining the group of two using substitutions? So, you start with some uh, segment of finite subword, but because remember, our words describe graphs, so I will do graphs instead of words, but it's the same. Uh, let's say G1 is the graph. With two vertices connected by an edge labeled by A. So, in other words, it's one letter consisting of symbol uh, A. Our S will be A, B, C, A, B, C, B, C, B. Oops. And then uh, I will have a set of what I call connectors. So, EN will be the graphs. Uh, either this graph B, C, C, D, D with two loops, or you have C, D, B, B, or you have uh, D, D, 
C C. And it's this case when n is zero, mod three. This case when n is one, mod three. This case when n is two, mod three. Okay, it might be not exactly what it is in the original Gibbertsch group, but if you're very isomorphic. And then we have an inductive rule that Jn plus one is Jn connected by Eden with Jn. So you take two copies of Jn and connect them together by one of these three connectors, depending on the on n mod c, on the residue mod c. So this will give you longer and longer finite uh, words, finite graphs, and you take any now infinite graph with the same finite subgroups such that all its all its finite subgraphs are subgraphs of this sequence. So you have a sequence, an increasing sequence of finite graphs, and then you take any word W, any graph W, such that all finite subgraphs of W are subgraphs of some of these graphs. Uh, and any such W will define the river tree. And the fact that it's even repetitive is automatic because we have instructed them in this way as as a linear as a substitution of this of this sort uh, and this construction is i forgot how much time is it ten left okay so i have uh, this construction is very flexible for example uh, we can do the following trick and embed the Gregorchuk group into a simple finite generated group of intermediate groups in torsion. So the Gregorchuk group is reducibly finite, but one, one can embed it into a simple group with the same properties torsion, finite generation, intermediate groups. And the trick is just modifying this. Uh, recursion in a very simple way. Namely, first of all, we start with two initial graphs. We take I1 to be the graph which connects two words by A2, then DC, DR loops, then A0, and J1 is. A to B C D D uh, A one. So instead of A, if you write A here everywhere, it will be in the previous notation I two. So it's, it will be the graph of the virtual group, but uh, the second one. Uh, so I just decorated A by indices. So it will be the same group, the same graph as the virtual group, but A's, the labels A's will be decorated by three indices. Of course, there are some missing A's, it's not perfectly labeled. So in order to make it perfectly labeled, you have to add loops. So for example, here you have to add loops A1, A0, but, uh, but that will be very uh, complicated picture, but that, that's what it will be. And then the inductive rules are. Uh, also, mutations of the Gregorian group rules, but uh, as follows: I n plus one is J n E n, the same connectors for the Gregorian group. J inverse inverse meaning that you flip the graph, you write it in the opposite direction, and J n plus one is J n E n I n flipped and then so you get two sequence two infinite sequences of finite graphs and you declare that uh, you take any sequence again such that all finite any infinite graph such that all finite subgraphs are subgraphs of some of these graphs so you take any element of the shift generated by these finite words and then it will generate will it will be a group. And in that group, if you take the 
first of all, in that group, A1, A2, it's A0, A1, A2, the pairwise commute, because it, one can see that they are involutions that do not, but with their involutions that a pairwise disjoint supports, so they commute. And their product will be exactly the original element generator A of the group of two. So what we did do is split our generator A into three, in the product of three independent involutions. So the regulatory group will be embedded into this group. And one can prove that by the theorem that I, by theorem two, which I mentioned, we will get that this group is actually uh, also of intermediate growth. And growth, by the way, I didn't mention it, the growth will be bounded uh, by uh, a function of this kind, the exponent of C n to the alpha, with alpha bigger than this other group, two group. Of course, because the original group is inside there. And one can prove that this group is virtually simple. So the, the commutator subgroup of this bigger group will be simple. And because any subgroup of an index of the virtual group contains the virtual group, the commutator subgroup will also contain the virtual group. So that will give you an embedding of the virtual group into a simple torsion, find a uh, group of intermediate. Another application of this approach is uh, following. So, uh, in theorem one, uh, I mentioned that if the action is repetitive, uh, then the group is amenable. But if you can have uh, groups uh, with non amenable groups in this way. In fact, if you take uh, uh, basically a random graph like uh, like uh, okay let, let, let me say it this way let's take three letters a b and c and let's draw the graph uh, at random so we take command by a and then we decide at random sorry c at random whether this will be c or b and then next time we decide at random there will be only, only two choices for the next one. We decide at random which of these two choices we choose. So we get a mark of chain. And if you follow this mark of chain at random and you fill, fill out all this graph uh, with probability one, it will, the group that will be described by this graph will be the free product of three groups of order two. Why? Because with probability one, you will see any admissible word there. Any word will be there. So if you take any word in this free product, there will be some find with probability one, you will find a subgraph such that that word will not be a loop, will not correspond to a loop in, um, in this graph. So this will be a free uh, product. So theorem two gives you examples of graphs which give you intermediate growth, this random forcing of maybe, maybe not random it doesn't have to be random but forcing all possible subgraphs subwords will give you frequency and now you can combine these two approaches and using the the uh, the remark that i made at the beginning of the lecture that if balls of radius r are the same in two graphs then the kd graphs will also have isomorphic balls of radius r so one using this information one can combine two kinds of groups you can construct some substitutions that produce intermediate groups or intermediate growth and then use another substitution which produces group which has a big which has subgroups uh, of as uh, these groups as subgroups these three products are subgroups and using the, this fact, you can construct groups that for a long while have k graphs isomorphic to k graphs from groups of intermediate growth, but then for a very long while, the, the k graphs are have, uh, isomorphic to k graphs, balls in the k graphs are isomorphic to balls in the k graphs of groups of exponential growth. And so, combining these two kind of constructions, uh, one can construct uncountably many different growth types and carefully ensuring 
in some other conditions, one can prove that one can construct then simple groups uh, with these uncountable many growth times. So another theorem, theorem C, is that uh, uh, there exists uncountable continuum. Of pairwise different growth types growth types of finitely generated simple groups okay that's all what i wanted to say thank you very much